any of you want to give a short talk right now <laughs> <laughs> to finish up what you were? Make sure to hold the microphone. If not, we'll just open it up for questions and and. Uh, Okay, back. So, uh, Doug had mentioned something in his talk that uh, just kind of breezed past him, but I thought, oh, let's go back to that. Um, something like, didn't matter the density of the stand, they all got hosed and the uh, opinion died off. Sure. The question was that whether or not the density of the opinion stand mattered when um, uh, a study that uh, measured uh, the percent die off. I cited a single study, but it was a study by uh, Lisa Floyd and colleagues uh, that looked at uh, several sites in, uh, I think, New Mexico, Arizona, and, and uh, either Utah or Colorado. It was three of the four, four corner states. And they did not really find a, a substantial relationship between uh, density um, and the percent pinion uh, mortality. Uh, I think they identified a very weak relationship at one end of the spectrum, but it wasn't uh, particularly meaningful. And on the whole, they found uh, no strong relationship or no significant relationship. Uh, but you'd have to check the study for the specifics. I'm citing it somewhat from memory. Uh, but it's a fairly recent paper. It came out in 2009. Um, I think it uh, might have been forest ecology and management, uh, but I'd have to double check. So is that, that's what you're referring to? Um, I, I did a study with a student of mine that also looked at the density dependence of pinion mortality and single leaf pinion, and we did find a, a moderately strong relationship um, in, in northern Nevada across 11 mountain ranges. So we need more studies. Yeah, I would agree with that. Juniper present, like if there's more juniper present, what defines can they kind of kill the pine trees? Um, we looked for that effect. I don't think we found that effect. We did look at the effect of mixed stands versus pure stands. This was also endemic levels of pin, mostly pinion ips caused uh, pinion mortality. It wasn't the same epidemic um, situation that, that Doug is talking about, yeah. where there it makes there it's logical that density might be less important when you truly have an epidemic that's running on its own steam, basically. Uh, let me follow up a little bit on that, too. Okay. Um, there's a researcher named Jose Negron with U.S. Forest Service. I think he's still in Fort Collins. Yeah. He did some research on this, too. And I believe he came out with a, a you know, that it really didn't matter with the density until you got really low densities. Um, and the number that sticks in my head is like, 10, either 10 square feet of basal area or 10% of max SDI. I can't recall exactly what the conversation we had, but this has been several years back now. Uh, but if you do a search on his uh, his name, you may come up with a research paper on that. Uh, I had a question with regard to uh, climate change assessment. Actually, we're trying to the gentleman said, you're in the middle of the room, Urban Smith with PLM. Uh, the Bureau is involved with the an effort to deal with eco-regional assessments, uh, Colorado Plateau, Great Basin, uh, looking at what it, what effects uh, will occur on land uh, through a window uh, at 25 and 50 years, so we can understand major land disturbing activities occurring in some locales that have impact. And I'm curious, maybe back to Berlin, with the kind of input or perspectives that were shared today about how much with regard to PJ resources are actually going to be brought into those assessments, if anything at all. Um, just a question. I realize that this is important information. I know as far as pinion, I'm going to get too close to this thing, pinion's response goes on our central Nevada midden sites in response to that same two degree global warming I was talking about. We show pinion going up elevationally maybe as much as 2,800 feet over about a thousand year period. Now it's not going to be able to do that in a hundred years, but as a result there's going to be some pretty significant reduction probably and community dominance, I mean, in, in community diversity. 
There's things that just can't handle the changes, drop out before other things that will be adapted to that condition can have a chance to get in there. So things that I suspect over the rest of this century are going to be pretty dynamic and pretty site specific. Um, Mary had a question. Yeah, and it had to do with, and I don't know who would like to deal with this, um, understory. Um, I mean, there's the scenario of the burning, the stand replacing fire and often getting cheatgrass. But if you were to uh, um, envision what would favor retaining the maximum native understory given the increasing density of the PJ, what would you think it would be? Yeah. Basically, that's our Sage Step project. Have you heard of it? That Gene Shoup and the back and I are involved with for the last six years. A series of sites all the way from southern Utah to central Oregon where we're looking at fire and mechanical. In Utah, two types of mechanical with control over a range of tree dominance to see where that point comes when treating the trees results in the cheatgrass rather than the understory. And I think we're, we're isolating that point. Once you get a certain level of tree dominance and you burn it, you get cheatgrass. But at some point below that zone, you get a real nice response to the native understory. And we, right now we're trying to work out the, quanti the quantitative data on what level of understory has to be there when the disturbance occurs for it to remain in control of the site. That's still being worked out. I would add to that by saying that it's the interaction of tree dominance with site condition and environment. Um, if you have, if, if it's a favorable site, then you might also get establishment from seed bank or a favorable response from the re-sprouters that are present on the site. So I, I think it's both. I, I agree. I did one study on the Incompatible Plateau on post-fire cheatgrass invasion and uh, you know climate variability is important uh, uh, when fires burn during wet years or when the following springs were wet um, all the way nine years post fire so all the fire years in between uh, the oldest fire at nine years and the most recent fire that we sampled at one year post fire um, would have a strong relationship uh, between uh, cheatgrass percent cover and climate so between climate variability <laughs> environmental conditions, land use history, presence of other uh, cheatgrass uh, seed banks and so on. Um, it, it gets to be pretty complex in a hurry, but I, I think that these trends are logical. From an operational standpoint, it's probably important if you're looking at your understory to try to treat your, your stand before the understory is completely gone. And uh, you know, have to have to develop some local knowledge as far as uh, at what stage and how much understory you really need, and um, what type of operation is going to uh, uh, say removing some trees or all of the trees. Are you going to get a, a good response from your understory? Uh, and you know, what type of operation you might have where you could actually destroy the understory in that operation, you may, may have to reseed it uh, during the operation. And um, we've done a fair amount of that with, uh, with BLM down around Cedar City. And uh, a lot of the things that we do, we seed. With if, all natives? Uh, I wish I could say yes, but I can't. Okay. Uh, Paul, <clears throat> um, several of you alluded to, and I think a lot of this conference is based on the, this l sort of lower elevation, rather rapid expansion, and perhaps this is a great um, wood basket for biomass use. Now, if, if we factor in climate, and my understanding of reading Robin's things over the last 20 years or so, is we have these periodic expansions and contractions in terms of elevation. If, if, is the biomass, where's the most resilient part of the forest to harvest biomass? I heard Robin say perhaps there's some middle layer elevationally. 
But I, I guess I'm a little concerned that there's a, a rapid expansion in the 20th century. In my own work, I've looked at Palmer Drought Severity Index, and this is one of the wettest centuries, at least in northern Utah, the last thousand years. So that's probably a big part of that expansion, perhaps some cultural land management things too. Are we safe hitting that rapid expansion? Because what you hear on the street and when you go to meetings and talk to land managers is, wow, this is an unnatural rapid expansion, we gotta get it now. But I guess I'm, I'm sort of a little bit skeptical of that and perhaps this is a, an expansion that's, that goes up and down over time. I heard all of you allude to that, but how do we deal with that? Do we, is it an unnatural expansion in which we harvest a lot of biomass now? Or is that the least resilient, perhaps, of, of the, the full elevational range of PJ? Any or all? Well, I'm going to try to answer this complex, but what's going on here is, yeah, we have this rapid expansion. I wouldn't call it, I forget the term you used, it's not unnatural. It is, it is a natural part of whatever climate change we had coming out of the Little Ice Age. It's just unusual in that there hasn't been anything like that for several hundred years and may not be again in the future. The consequences of that, however, are very real. We have those high densities now. They are developing very high fuel loads. When we get those big fires, we're getting cheatgrass conversion on large areas. That's, in many ways, a permanent replacement of what was there. And so we're, we've got a very short time window in here to do something to deal with that at some level. And to my thinking, if we can get some biomass out at the same time, that's, that's helping to defray the cost of it. But we need to break up these large contiguous stands. If you get a contiguous stand large enough, you can burn 6,000 acres in eight hours. We're going to have to start breaking those up to cut the size of these down to make it possible for firefighters to get in there and deal with it. There's been three of these now that I have talked to firefighters afterward. In every case, they said this fire was doing things I had never seen before. You get that much fuel across that large area landscape under very dry and high wind, very dry and high wind conditions, and I guess it's kind of scary. But we're going to lose a lot of territory to exotics if we don't do something, and yet. We have to be careful what we do. It's sort of a triage is going to have to go on here because we don't have a lot of resources. We're going to have to pick and choose where we take action. For the majority of this area, we're going to have to figure out how we're going to revegetate after these fires and after the insect attacks and so on. Yeah, it's uh, one of the founding fathers of uh, forestry and wildlife biology, Aldo Leopold, said, first rule of intelligent tinkering is maintaining all the parts. So I, I would advocate doing management where you can do management and keep your, your parts, whether it be the trees and the, and the shrubs and the forbs, and so that when that change does come, hopefully one of those parts can respond. I'd like to address the question in a, in a slightly different way, and I'm not sure if, it, if it's answering the question. But we heard from Doug quite a bit about the extensive mortality, mostly to the pinion component of the woodlands in the, in, in the southwest. And we heard from Robin how we're beginning to see a decline in new pinion and juniper recruitment, and we're starting to see mortality. And Robin's prediction is that the climate-associated mortality in the near future will greatly outweigh the ability of these tree species to respond to climate change. So I think another element that we have to think about in terms of these treatments um, is not treating the landscape such that we're fighting the ability of this component of the landscape, the wooded portion, to respond to climate change. That doesn't necessarily trump the need for management to reduce fire risk and things. It, it's another consideration that we don't want to manage in a direction that um, impedes the already strongly challenged ability of these species to, to track future change in climate. I think you're driving at resilience? Resilience at the landscape scale as opposed to the site scale, or, or adaptation management, maybe. So, yeah. I'll, I'll second what Peter said, because what we do can really reinforce or impede the ability of these species to respond naturally. 
like operationally, what does that look like? Uh, uh, lower STI retention in the residual scans at lower elevation, say, or what? That may very likely be. <clears throat> it uh, It's going to depend um, highly on the site and the species present, you know, what the soils are like, what your local climate is like. Um, you might want to make some predictions in your prescription for climate change and plan for that. Uh, and and uh, so, you know, uh, in some sites, if you treat them, you may do more harm than good and maybe better just to leave it alone and uh, come back le at a later date and see if some things have changed. Uh, so. Did you have questions here? Uh, yeah, I did, but Paul kind of oh, addressed okay. it. I, I might phrase it in a different way, though, because uh, uh, um, not real familiar with Pinion Juniper. I think it's really interesting. I'm uh, curious about this, this rapid expansion. I think when we think about biomass and uh, uh, density uh, de uh, densification stands nationwide, we, we typically attribute that to to wildfire suppression, and I'm getting the feeling from you, Robin, that you don't feel like that's the the uh, the driver of that uh, that increased density. But I'm also not getting the sense of what you think the driver is, and I wonder if you, you must have thought about this. I wonder if you could just tell us what the possibilities that you thought about. It. Maybe it's the increased moisture availability. I'm not sure what the driver was that caused the expansion. I mean, what you know, except I think it has something to do with some combination of climatic factors, a lot of which we probably have not yet figured out. But I also said that it's equally, equally part the land management, land use activities we're involved in. There's a climate driver, but the expression of that is very much influenced by how we're managing the land. I think that includes fire suppression. Through fire suppression, we are influencing where that driver can be expressed on the landscape and how dense those things can get. How we graze, how we do a lot of other things are all having an influence and exactly what those are is pretty complex and we haven't really worked it out. Uh, Stan, I, I, uh, I get somewhat maybe of a sick pleasure uh, in going to places that have recently burned, meaning within days, weeks to a few years, and see what they look like after after the fact. Um, and uh, it gives you an opportunity to, to question all the things we're talking about today as you're walking through the skeletal trees or and, and whatever happens to be growing in response. Nature has a way of trying to heal regardless if something usually is growing. It doesn't stay a moonscape. <coughs> and, and you're aware, you're obviously very aware of that. But so kind of a two-part question based upon that experience. One is sometimes in a place I really don't expect it, after one of those burns, I see um, uh, more juniper, less pinion. I see juniper trees recruiting in, in that burnscape within 10 year period of time uh, af after after fire has, has, has taken place. And so the first question, I'll ask the second one and then be quiet, is do you consider that rare for the Great Basin and perhaps Colorado Plateau to see uh, juniper seedlings relatively soon after a fire in, in a burned area? And the, the second part of the question is, the other thing that's obvious when you're walking through these, these landscapes is even when the fire burns very hot, there's a lot of woody biomass left standing. I mean, all the fine fuels burn up or, or are affected, but the, the, the longer burning fuels, generally speaking, unless wood was exposed when the fire came through, is still standing. There's a lot of solid wood material. Is there, from the perspective of this conference, do you see um, value in terms of salvage work on burn places that already burn in terms of uh, harvesting that biomass for some possible use 
I'll take a stab at, at the first one of your questions. And this is something I've been really interested in looking at too quite a bit, Stan. And that's almost always what I see is that post-burn, the juniper does come in uh, much more effectively than pinion, especially if it's like 10 years after the burn, you'll see some juniper seedlings. And the pinion seems to require a suitable microsite, a shrub, or sometimes a big piece of wood, or even a rock, but usually a shrub, usually a sagebrush. And the sagebrush itself takes a while to come in, as you very well know. It can take a while to come in after the burn and grow to a suitable size to provide a microsite for a pinion. Plus, I think there's other things that are keeping pinion out of burns that might have more to do with soil properties that we just don't know about yet. Um, as for the second part of your question, maybe somebody else wants to approach that. I mean, uh, f for ecological considerations might be the, the, the role of large woody debris for controlling sheet erosion on certain sites or perhaps for providing habitat or microsites. Um, but do others want to? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> for the first part, Stan, my observations match yours, is that I, I do see the juniper coming in sooner than the pinion. Um, sites that I've seen, it's been almost uh, 10 years before I'd see a pinion seedling, whereas junipers might be there a year or two later. Um, in the second part of it, um, there's some operational uh, difficulties with dealing with that dead wood. Uh, if you've ever cut, uh, let's say, juniper for firewood with your chainsaw, you know cutting the green stuff is very easy. You run through it. But you start cutting the dead stuff, and you're stopping to sharpen your saw all the time. And we've run into some of those with these uh, these uh, trials we've done, some operational problems of the same type with uh, even these big grinders. Uh, if you let that wood get dry, it just wears the teeth down on those. So it really increases the cost of, uh, of harvesting those trees and utilizing. And then the, the pinion um, Depends a little bit on how old that tree was and the moisture regime there, but it tends to rot a little quicker than than the juniper too. So that uh, there's probably a life uh, a lifespan there uh, or shorter lifespan as far as usable wood there goes. I'll just add one thing in the first part of your question that might be related, and that has to do with the long-term chaining study that Peter's student worked on. We aged the trees that came in after the chaining. The first 10 to 15 years, that was almost exclusively juniper. About, after about 15 years, that shifted. And by the time you got out to 35, 40 years, it was all almost all pinion, the new recruitment. So there was a, a definite shift over a long term. I was going to say that, yeah, same thing on the Colorado Plateau, uh, at least in my study sites. Uh, but I think that's a successional pattern that's been recognized, at least there, for some years. Uh, Erdman, back in the 60s, um, documented uh, post-fire successional stages, and, and essentially uh, junipers would be uh, typically sooner to establish. And in my sites, uh, which were clearly post-fire, um, we, we would have uh, evidence of opinions that maybe um, lag behind junipers by maybe 20 or 30 years or as much as 100 years. Uh, it's not always clear with those really big gaps if that meant no pinions became established or there was, you know, maybe some mortality. But that, that trend, I think, is definitely uh, the case uh, even in the uh, Utah juniper, Colorado pinion woodlands in uh, the, the Colorado Plateau. So. As a follow-up comment, it would sound, since there seems to be some uniformity in the observations, that, that if indeed there, there were to be large die-offs of... Um, due to fire, not necessarily climate, but due to fire uh, in the Great Basin or elsewhere uh, because of this homogenized uh, high levels of fuel that the long-term result or longer-term result would be a conversion from pinion juniper to just juniper. And there's been a lot of speculation about that lately in the literature that uh, that may be where we're heading, not only because of fires, but uh, because, because of dieback and, and because of drought and, and uh, beetle outbreaks. And so. a loss of woodland altogether no. In the 
no and and so if we didn't have to face the the uh, non-native species risk the cheatgrass risk i don't think the fires in and of themselves um are necessarily cause for alarm in fact they may have be part of this sort of natural waxing and waning of the pinion component on the landscape uh, beat back occasionally by uh, drier periods or, or major disturbance uh, events and so on. I think the real threat now is this permanent conversion that Robert, uh, that uh, Robin was, uh, you know, talking about earlier with with cheat and other non-natives, so tumble mustards and so on. I agree with Doug, but, but um, in, in much of the Nevada pinion juniper woodlands, especially in the central part of the state, it's 90 percent or 95 percent pinion and 5 percent or 10 percent juniper. So if the juniper was all that was left following such disturbances, there might not be that much left unless the juniper was able, unless the juniper is not there currently because it's being outcompeted by pinion. Our midden studies had a little interesting insight on that. We have some sites where prior to the arrival of pinion, it was juniper. And then as pinion moved in, Juniper either became dramatically reduced or entirely eliminated. And our best site is on the Clan Alpine Mountains, with a, with a middens that covers about 11,000 years. At 11,000 years, there was no trees. By 10,000, Juniper had arrived. I think it was down at lower elevations in Dixie Valley to the west. Juniper was the only tree there until about 4,400 years ago when Pinion showed up. 400 years later, Juniper was gone. Today, it's a thin, narrow band all the way down at the bottom of the woodland. And yet, 5,000 years ago, it covered the full range. Because that el met midden is up near the upper elevation where the woodlands occur. And we've seen this pattern in several places. And But this is in areas from about s the eastern third of Nevada west where you have very little summer rain. In fact, if you get over in the Inyo Mountains on the western side of the basin, Juniper is not the lowest elevation tree. You don't pick it up until you get almost a third of the way into the woodland. At the lowest elevation is pinion. Once you hit eastern Nevada and on into Utah, then it's juniper down at the bottom. And I think summer rain has a lot to do with that. So there's some pretty complex interactions going on here. I've been <coughs> informed we should wrap this up. <laughs> I know there's probably a lot more uh, discussion. Don't mind you <laughs> So let's give yeah. these speakers. We really have four experts here to answer our questions. Thank you guys.